I want to talk to you about one of my total passions. I, I am just captivated by submarine volcanoes. It's a secret that I haven't let out until tonight. So, and I want to share it with you from four different points of view. The point of view of the global distribution of underwater volcanoes, which, when, when's the last time people in this audience saw an underwater volcano? That's what I thought tonight. Then I want to talk about it from a personal point of view, which I'd love to share with you. And then I want to talk about it from a planetary point of view. And then, I, because this is Dublin, I wanted to share with you the view of an underwater volcano from a close friend of mine who is a poet, the Poet Laureate of the State of Maryland, Michael Collier. And I'm going to do all that in 18 minutes. What you're seeing here is the top of El Guapo. It's a submarine vent system. This is one of the stunning images that you find if you go a mile, mile and a half down to the seafloor with the right kind of HD camera. About 60 to 70 percent of the world's volcanism occurs underwater. And mid-ocean ridges creates about two-thirds of the surface of the planet about every 200 million years. You probably didn't know that. There are hundreds of thousands of underwater volcanoes seamounts, which are different from the ridge crest. And there are only a small number, two, maybe three underwater volcanoes that have ever been actually witnessed. And none of them, none have ever been uh, studied. And, and there are potential resources associated with these things that are just phenomenal. So here's the ridge crest. What's in orange is the youngest rocks on the planet, and the black line in the video is following that ridge crest. So here we are, right in here, coming south to the Bove tri Triple Junction. We're going to turn left and go into the Indian Ocean. And you're flying along the longest volcano probably in the solar system. I don't want to compete with, Hel with Carolyn Parco, but this is a 70,000 kilometer long volcano. It's the largest feature on the surface of the planet. We're in the Indian Ocean now. This is the Indian Ocean Triple Junction. And now we're flying along the southeast uh, in, uh, Indian Ocean Ridge, which is over on the right-hand side of the screen here, if I can find the... And now we're... That's uh, New Zealand. We just went by. And now we're coming into the Pacific. And we're going up along the East Pacific rise, and we're looking at the two microplates that are forming. There are new plates that have been born within the last million years, headed north toward Baja California. But we're going to go by the Galapagos first. And we are flying about 50,000 kilometers of the 70,000 kilometer ridge crest. It is erupting everywhere, or always somewhere. And it's the, the reddish tint in the background image there is, are the youngest rocks on the planet. Now, the, the sort of uh, icing on the top of the crust of the ocean, all of which is volcanic, two-thirds of the planet, are these little seamounts. And some of them aren't so little. You can see in the distance uh, Hawaii. And Hawaii is an amazing beast. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a huge, huge single vol uh, multiple volcano. But see, it's in a, a, a chain of volcanoes. And in fact, if you look around the Pacific, you see many of these chains of volcanoes. And often, most often, they go to the ridge crest. This is an, a quick overview showing you, basically, the white ones are, are uh, 8,000 meters high off the sea floor. So not only is the five kilometer thick layer of the oceanic crust, which is layered over the mantle of the Earth, all volcanic basalt, but on top of it are decorations, which are these seamounts, all of which are volcanically active in one form or another. Now, in the context of the, the global or the Pacific uh, viewpoint here, I wanted to share with you the last 40 years of major earthquakes. These are earthquakes greater than magnitude six and up to magnitude 8.8. .8. And they're color-coded, see on the left. And the little 
red wedges are active volcanoes, some of which you may have actually seen, because they're not, all of them are not um, below sea level. I'm going to run it again. Notice the frequency with which there are earthquakes now in, in this portion toward, and, and compare that to the part at the end of the, of the uh, little video clip, which is cycling again. And you'll see what I think is an increase in the frequency of major earthquakes. To my knowledge, this has not been commented upon, but it seems evident. Now, right in here, you can see the Sumatra earthquake. You'll see the Chilean earthquake in a second. Boom. And while you were watching that, Tohoku uh, Japanese earthquake took place. So why am I showing you this? It's that the ring of fire, which is the ring around the Pacific made up of volcanoes, is also the ring of earthquakes. And they're linked together in ways that are just really fascinating. So let's look at the one or two uh, volcano that has actually been observed erupting. It was discovered more or less by accident, but here it is. This is West Mata, and watch the eruption. It's, this is amazing. This, this, is, this is birth. This is, many people believe that life on Earth originated at the interface between underwater volcanoes, probably erupting or not erupting, but doing both, because there have been billions and billions of volcanic eruptions under the global ocean since the 4 to 4.5 billion year period uh, that we had an ocean and we had an oceanic crust. So this is an exciting opportunity, I think, for us to begin thinking about why we would be interested. Well, one reason they're interesting is because of the microbes. Out of erupting volcanoes and out of hydrothermal systems on the seafloor come microbes that we've never seen before. Microbes that can thrive at temperatures at least to 121 degrees centigrade that have enzymes in them that may be useful in industry and certainly next generation pharmaceuticals are liable to uh, be developed uh, as a result of sampling these kinds of volcanoes. Well, if you, looking at this map, if you lived in Seattle or even in North America, where would you go to study this system where the youngest rocks are in the process of being formed? It's pretty evident you would head for the Juan de Fuca tectonic plate. On the left sand side here, the corner there is the corner of the tectonic plate, and we're gonna look at a cross section through the plate. And you can see where the melting is and the, the, the uh, rich orange color represents the rise of magma, molten rock from, that's partially melted from the underlying crust. It forms the tectonic plates, one that goes to the, to the uh, west and one goes to the east. The one moving to the east is the Juan de Fuca tectonic plate. And you'll notice after it goes, it, it spreads for about uh, 10 million years, it subducts or plunges beneath North America and creates the Cascade Volcanic Range, Mount, Re Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, and those, those kinds of volcanoes. So within about a 300 kilometer distance from the west coast, we have all the major processes that operate around the planet are, are sort of captured there. So we had the idea, why don't we turn the entire Juan de Fuca tectonic plate and the overlying ocean into a natural laboratory where we can bring everybody uh, up to speed on what goes on underwater all the time. That's what we set out to do. Underneath the spreading center is a pocket of molten rock called magma, which when it erupts to, through cracks in the, in the crust to the seafloor spreads out as a new volcanic uh, lava flow. The other thing is we have recently discovered that the oceanic crust itself is populated by microbes and they're the really exotic forms of, of life. Here on this diagram you can see where the seafloor is spreading apart, that's where the Juan de Fuca plate and the Pacific plate are pulling apart at about the speed your fingernails grow, they, it, you have the opportunity to study the ridge crest process. But at the same time, there's axial volcano, which is right on top of the ridge crest, generating a line of seamounts off to the, to the northwest. And here's a close-up view of, of what we call axial volcano. It's on the axis of the ridge. And the the three sites, Chasm, Ashes, and the International District, are places where there are hydrothermal activity. I also want to point 
your attention to the caldera, which is a box-like feature. It's about three kilometers across, and it's a depression in the top of the volcano, which has been caused by the uh, withdrawal of molten rock beneath the in the in the magma chamber. So it's pretty exciting. Now, what happened in July this year? Well, I had a phone call from a, a friend of mine by the name of Bill Chadwick, who said, "John, we're out here on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. We're on Axel Seamount." and we've discovered a fresh lava flow. None of us knew it, was, it had happened. It's really very exciting. The rock you're looking at, when it was photographed here, is only three months old. Uh, and here's the best evidence. This is an anchor chain. It has a mooring up above it, and it's surrounded by the fresh lava. And it wasn't surrounded by the fresh lava when they put it out last year. So this was the first hint that Bill had that there was an eruption. Well, we marshaled a lot of people that were involved in studying these systems. And first thing happened was that uh, Dave Caress and, and Dave Clegg from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute responded to Bill's invitation to help out. And remember, I pointed out ashes and the International District, watch the, the central lower part of the diagram. You see the difference there? That's the lava flow. We had mapped the area before, and as a result of Chadwick letting everybody know this had happened, within two weeks of the discovery, uh, the folks from Mbari were out there with an underwater, autonomous underwater vehicle, and they mapped the sea floor with a resolution of much better than a meter. And what you're looking at there is the lava flow, the light blue down by ashes. It wasn't there before, and it's there now. So why am I so excited about that? Well, one thing that we try to do with volcanoes is understand them more deeply. And to do that, we have to make measurements. We have to make measurements of the volumes of magma, the amount of heat, the amount of chemicals, the amount of biology. It's really exciting to have this basis already. Within two weeks of discovering the system, we know where the lava flows went and how thick they are, and so we can calculate the volume of erupted material. That's, for an oceanographer or geologist, that's, that's close to heaven, I think. I, I haven't actually experienced the latter, but the former is pretty good. Uh, now, the International District, there's a number of sulfide pillars that are formed as a result of crystallization of sulfide materials, iron pyrite, chalcopyrite, things like that, as a result of hot water streaming out from below the seafloor at, at high temperatures. And it's entirely populated with all sorts of uh, animals uh, that are living off of the fluid that diffuses through the walls and mixes with cold seawater and provides microbial uh, activity with enough nutrients to keep even larger animals alive. So El Guapo is one, that's International District. Here is part of that brand new fresh lava flow. This is three months old as we photographed it. And out of the seafloor, in this almost ghostly way, is coming massive amounts of microbial material. Where did it come from? Is it new? It's been going on like this for three and a half months. It's still going on. There's a creation going on here where there's multiplication of organisms that live below the seafloor, and they continue to flow out at rates that are astonishing, because there's about 20 or 30 of these these, we call them snow blowers. It's a very technical term. And now we're over at Ashes, and I want to show you Inferno. Inferno is uh, one of these little sulfide deposits. This is a down looking photograph. There's about uh, 600 of these individual photographs that we've mosaiced together, and what you're looking at is the top of the lava flow with cracks in it, and you see the whitish material is all the microbial activity that fills in the cracks because that's where the fluid comes. So they align themselves and become very productive there. And that's what Inferno looks like. It's, it's just, uh, uh, that's beautiful to me. It's, I, I, I've been told it's ugly, but, but you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But let's go in closer. Here's what it actually looks like. Those are limpets, palm worms, and scale worms, and they're thriving in this environment. We're 1,200 meters 
below the level that, that light, sunlight penetrates. Multiply this by the 70,000 kilometers of ridge crest and the hundreds of thousands of seamounts, and you begin to get an idea of why I'm so excited about something that nobody knows anything about it. Now, here's the, 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 the area under the word fin is a sort of downtown hydrothermal city, and it, this is what it looked like in 1997. In 1998, we put that cage down, and I blush to disclose what I'm going to tell you next. We took an underwater chainsaw, and we're from the Pacific Northwest, a lot of trees, and we came in and we chopped the thing off. We, we, I, should, I didn't say that. We surgically removed the upper 6,000 pounds of rock from this thing, and it's now on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. What we didn't understand, we didn't expect, is what's shown 18 hours, 40 hours, and three days, the damn thing grew back <laughs> in three days. By 2007, not only had it grown a structure that was much bigger than what we cut, but it's populated entirely with all sorts of, of uh, uh, organisms that are living off the biology that is fed by the microbial biology that is fed by the effluent that comes through the walls. Everything I've shown you so far involves the fluid coming out of those sulfide structures and rising about 100 meters and then wafting off in one direction or another depending on the local currents. But the white one, that's an eruptive event. That's what happens when volcanoes erupt. There is a massive injection up as much as 1,000 meters above the seafloor. We've never caught that. We've never been there when that happened, nor have we ever been there to anticipate when it could happen. And that's what I want to talk about now. This program, National Science Foundation in the US, funded a program called the Ocean Observatories Initiative, and the regional cabled component stretches across the Juan de Fuca plate. And it gives us a perfect situation where we can actually be present without being there on axial seamount and other places as well through robotic systems, through sensor systems, through the ability to move them around, the ability to transmit high definition video from 20 different cameras simultaneously back to land, archive it, and then put it on the internet. So all of this, it won't be ne necessary to hack it because it'll all be given away free. So we're gonna map out this box and we're gonna have constantly patrolling uh, autonomous vehicles and gliders that are constantly moving through the volume of the whole thing all the time. We will have another system uh, that, that's an, another kind of autonomous underwater vehicle there in the lower left, which will be constantly patrolling right close to the caldera. And here's the event that we're hoping to catch. Now, I, I don't want to imply that what I'm showing you now is funded, but it will be, because I know that all of you will want to contribute so that you can see this in, in your own video uh, right after the uh, football games. This is what we imagine an underwater eruption would look like in terms of the hot fluid coming out, mixing with the colder fluid, and reaching a neutral buoyancy at about 1,000 meters up. And see on the bottom there, you can see an autonomous vehicle moving around, and off to the side are elevators that are going up and down. We control those through the fiber optic cable. We can decide what level the sensor packages are. We will have the ability now, uh, then, to quantify the output in terms of thermal output, in terms of chemical output, and in terms of the microbial output, because we'll be able to take samples. Now, off, let's go off planet for just a moment. This, as many of you immediately recognize, is Io. It's the closest moon to Jupiter. It is the most volcanically active body in the entire solar system. There's no water left. It's all burned off but it erupts continuously. On the right is another picture of Io, and you can actually see an eruptive plume on the limb, right at the edge. And right in the foreground, it looks like an eyeball, is another eruptive plume. And that plume is 100 kilometers up. I mean, this is a serious volcano. Its nearest neighbor, right next door, the next, one, next moon out, is the lovely Europa. And the European Ocean is a very interesting ocean. The surface of Europa is, is water ice, frozen very, very solid. This, the, there is no atmosphere to, that we know of, or at least not to the 10 to the minus 8th uh, atmospheres. <clears throat> but there are very few craters, almost no craters. 
So the interpretation is that the subsurface of this planet, of this body, this solar body, has been mobile and the cratering that inevitably took place three to four billion years ago has been erased due to something like a surface of plate tectonic made out of, of ice. And this is what some of us interpret the under side of this system to look like. We believe there are volcanoes there. So maybe some of the work that we're doing currently on our own planet will inform us so that when we get to the point where we can start thinking about how we go into other planets, inside the planets. This is Enceladus, uh, which is near Saturn. But the kinds of things that the, the folks at... Uh, at JPL and other places, the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and other places have been talking about is something like this, an underwater robot. When will that happen? Her grandchildren. Her grandchildren will certainly do this. We need to give the young folks something to dream about, something to create, something to imagine themselves as part of that is totally historical, that is totally challenging. Finding life on another planet is going, to, is going to be the game changer. What, are they, what do they say? There are, there are three great questions. Where did we come from? Where are we going? And are we alone? Maybe some of those could be answered by studying underwater volcanoes. And I know I'm just a simple country geologist that works you know, under, underwater, but I wanted to share with you what Michael Collier, my friend, wrote and I'm going to share it so that if you don't like the way I read, you can read it yourself. Fathom and League. Two miles down, the seafloor is a skull, the wounded head of a monster, fractured, faulted, ridged. It won't make me think of the earth as mother or understand Gaia, but rather that my heart is inside my body and neutral buoyancy is good. How else can the world be studied? But if life begins in the ocean, it thrives on hot and cold, in the tumble and boil of the sea, no longer silent. In Genesis, there's no happiness, only awe and improbability. The hideous is beautiful. Worms 10 feet long, clams the size of frisbees, and shrimp that swarm like insects. And something else, water burning inside water, smoking spires and chimneys, and here and there, to calibrate and measure, a weighted buoy, a probe, or a camera, I'm coming to retrieve, the sonar pings as if it had an ear to my heart. The echo coming back goes through and doesn't stop until it dissipates, a question formed of sound, empty of the shapes it failed to find beyond the submarine's perimeter of light. Now, at the site of the world's making and unmaking, the way to stay intact is to remain inside the sphere of the submarine. As if it were a choice I'd made to define myself, but it's no choice. The hatch is held in place by the weight of 300 atmospheres, sky upon sky. There's no courage in this safety. There's no danger in this passing. The data is siphoned. The vents have been named Godzilla, Hulk, Inferno. My metaphor for monster, the figure of fathom, measuring the depths, holding the unseen dark close, hearing in it the sound of its own shape, a name, then a creature, an issue made of what I hold and nothing more. Fathom, the span fingertip to fingertip of an embrace. Thank you.